Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Well, thank you and welcome everyone to uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping. My, again, my name is Shane Humble with Complete Property Maintenance. Um, you are now attending a uh, one hour uh, credit uh, and you know going towards your operation of physical property. So I thank you for attending. And also I'd just like to start off by saying for any of our uh, attendees that are out there up in the Big Bend Cedar Key area, I wish you the best of luck uh, for this upcoming storm. And uh, this might be uh, kind of fortuitous uh, having this seminar right now uh, talking about plant material because you know, there might be some replacements uh, and some care needed, uh, but let's hope for the best. Let's hope uh, uh, it doesn't strengthen and uh, everyone gets through it fine. So uh, with that being said, let's uh, let's kind of get started. So uh, the class today is going to talk about the kind of the best management practices um, with our landscapes here in the state of Florida. Uh, we are located down, you know, zone 10 area. So this was kind of geared towards there, but it does apply to most of the state. Um, but we're gonna start with a little bit of history. Uh, back in 2004, the Florida legislator created uh, section 373.228. And it was basically to direct the water management district and the DEP and other interested parties to come up with a set of standards for Florida friendly landscaping, uh, the design, as well as the irrigation. Took about a year and a half to two years to officially adopt these standards, which occurred in December of 2006. And any new ordinances that you know came about uh, at a municipality, city, et cetera, all have to uh, all were kind of uh, kind of taking the right steps forward to adopt any of these standards after this date. We're gonna we're gonna touch on those and we've got some uh, illustrations of pre and post uh, these uh, different ordinances that have come into place. So the, the main six Florida principles uh, for the friendly landscaping fall onto these, which you'll see on the left of your screen, it's the right plant, right place. Uh, and, and we're gonna touch on each of these six principles as we go through. The efficient watering for that material that has been chosen the selection of the appropriate fertilization for these, uh, these shrubs, turf, et cetera. How we might apply a ground cover, uh, such as uh, a mulch, rock, uh, whatever it may be, um, or ground cover. How this landscape can be used to attract wildlife or help manage it. And also the responsible management of pests. Now, as we go through, I will, uh, pay attention to the, uh, the you know, questions and answers um, to hopefully we'll maybe set a time for 20 minutes or so uh, in to uh, try to address some of these or we'll do it all at the end, depending on uh, participation. So the six principles will integrate the best management practices to help minimize the environmental impacts. However, that's not as easily done when you've got a developer uh, trying to reach certain expectations for his client or the end result. So this picture here we're showing, this was a site in West Palm. Um, it had a, uh, a number of kind of aging structures on it. The property was purchased and you can see it was brought back down to, to bare dirt uh, in order to create a, um, a new either plaza, housing, um, whatever the end result was, but so it's a different, difficult balance to achieve when you take this footprint of a commercial property and you have to meet certain criteria in terms of uh, parking requirements, pedestrian traffic, the landscape requirement uh, in regards to the municipality where it's taking place, the how you're going to deal with the runoff um, now that uh, you've gone from potentially turfed area or a forestry or a building, whichever may have been there and then how to maximize the revenue potential while also being attractive uh, depending on the client's needs. So Florida friendly landscape practices will usually include a number of items such as trees, ornamentals, turf grass, ground cover, 
um, and potentially some um, you know, type of water management, uh, depending on the actual development that's being created. The term Florida friendly, it refers to the plant material that's being uh, installed, you know, and they, and they do like to see a mix of native and non-native material. Uh, they want uh, the site to be cleared of uh, any invasives. Um, they would prefer to see some combination of native palms and trees as well as non-natives uh, that are gonna be able to achieve a balance either through light and shade, habitat control, erosion, whether the landscape plan is uh, utilized to redu reduce noise or modify temperature depending on the site. All of these factors are taken into account when a architect is uh, first handed off the project. All right, so we'll touch now on the first of the six principles, the right plant, right place. This refers to the selection and location um, of where the material is going to go. And, you know, taking uh, weather out of the equation that the cultural practice definitely plays the biggest role in the success of the agronomic program. And that agronomic program will typically include the following the turf grass that's selected and the height at which it's mowed, how the plant material is going to be um, kind of uh, enhanced or presented on the site and how it's gonna be pruned, the type of nutrients that can be applied to that material and how does it get there, and then the irrigation and how is it going to best be applied. So these components, definitely sound very different, but they are undisputedly related. For example, if you were to fertilize the turf during a drought period, you'll find that the leaching um, will be quite extensive right after a strong rain because the ground is very dry and hard. So that water runoff is much more rapid than if the soil was continually moist and able to absorb and uh, not have it hit and, and run off. Now, on the flip side, a inadequately fertilized, uh, you know, section of turf can definitely lead to it being thin or weak. And when a plant or turf is, um, you know, weak, they're definitely more susceptible to insect or disease. And weakened plants definitely do not have a strong root system, which further relates to issues in retaining the soil in the root zone, temperature. Um, becoming aerobic or non-aerobic, and that again will lead to soil erosion and possible water pollution. All right, some of the components of that. A healthy turf is definitely uh, viewed as an aesthetic asset, and it plays an important role in reducing the water runoff in urban and suburban properties, containing significant areas of impervious surfaces such as parking lots and sidewalks. Um, so in discussing that, you'll see this, uh, this slide here is showing a, uh, it's a very large uh, commercial retail uh, development that is uh, tucked in behind these uh, clusters of sable palms and fakahatchee grasses and turf grass. And what this area is, has been deemed uh, appropriate because of the size of the plaza that's behind and the amount of green space required in order to deal with the water that will be uh, collected during a rainfall on the uh, impervious surfaces and the, you know, the concrete paved parking areas, etc. So how, what, how that works is it, it can basically process greater amounts of rainfall, thus, in, you know, increasing the biodegradation of the various pollutants, air contaminants, etc., and pesticides that hopefully are not utilized if the landscape design was proper. Let's move forward here. Okay, um, this uh, actual site, this 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 slide's uh, a few years old, and uh, I can tell you if, if you're familiar. I know we've got people joining us from all over the state, but kind of in the North Palm area, there used to be a uh, a big retail store called Gander Mountain. I think that location now is uh, something like an at-home, uh, kind of like a you know Bed Bath and Beyond type of uh, uh, business. 
this particular landscape design was really fantastic. Uh, I watched this building come up out of the ground, paid attention to their planting, their, their scape, and you know, I'll just talk about it a little bit. Um, the, the design definitely matched the site's characteristics. And I feel like the desires of the client and the municipality were definitely met. Um, it was very obvious that a comprehensive site evaluation was done and they, uh, they, they kind of adhered to uh, all of the requests. I'm sure at some point, uh, you know, the soil type was analyzed, the the pH, uh, what type of shade the building would provide in which sections, um, and how were they going to best, you know, these are large parking lots. If you can imagine like a Bass Pro Shop or something, it's uh, not only you've got this large, you know, several tens of thousands square foot structure, you then have an equally large parking area to accommodate all the parking, but very little landscape typically. So most of these activities uh, in order to install the parking lot, install the building are, you know, they've created severe compaction on the entire site and probably contain non-native soils as fill in order to create the grade. And it makes it very difficult then to carry out a successful landscape design. Plant selection being very key. So based on the evaluation that the, the site will do, they have to be suited to the characteristics of where they're actually going. They, each plant's going to serve a particular function and a good design will, you know, in the end, expose the attributes and hopefully will strive based on their, where they're, you know, placed. So what should these plants do? What should the palms, what should the, you know, the, the large either uh, specimen trees or natives, uh, what should they do to the building? Well, basically they should improve the appearance or the usefulness by providing shade to the parking areas to reduce heat in the impervious areas along walkways uh, in order to enter the front door. They should help reduce cooling costs for the structure. They should also be positioned to provide a smooth transition from the structure to the landscape and screening from any roadways and direct traffic flow onto and within the property. And this, uh, I feel again that this, this particular project definitely uh, achieved that. Okay, uh, the next principle, um, efficient watering versus irrigation. And irrigation to me is one of the most important components of a successful landscape um, and why is that? Um, well, it ties in all aspects of what we do as a landscaper, um, basically because they're all linked. Um, and we're going to really get into more depth on that later, but I can just you know quickly say that one thing for sure, um, plants do not waste water. The people in charge of the irrigation do. So I, you know, I've simplified it by saying people do. Um, a prime example of that is the St. Augustine turf that most properties in Florida utilize, uh, developed at the University of Florida, uh, falls under the Floritam category, requires about 52 inches of irrigation, if you'd like to say, per year. Well, Ironically, uh, the state of Florida averages 52 to 55 inches of rainfall per year. So it's not, you know, it's not just coincidence. It was obviously developed, but that's what it requires. However, irrigation is used basically just to supplement the needs of our St. Augustine turf. It is not a complete substitute um, because we, we just don't get that rainfall evenly spaced throughout the year. So that's where the irrigation comes in. As we talked about before, most commercial properties, whether you're in a condo association, a homeowner's association, have at some point modified the soil and the habitat to fit the needs for the site. In order for the property to have received the certificate of occupancy, they have had to meet certain uh, matrix from the municipality in regards to the landscape requirements. So in theory, this sounds great, but one of the factors that typically does not get considered is the type of irrigation controller. So we'll talk a little bit here about, um, you know, what what there is available, um, 
And what we typically see at most sites um, is something kind of similar to what I've got here on the slide. This is a uh, considered a smart irrigation system. Um, it, this particular one, I believe, is Weathermatic. Um, and there are many, many out there. Um, Hydrowise, there are ones through um, all, all of your, you know, your large suppliers. Um, so here's the, as I mentioned before, the problem is that the rainfall is not spread evenly over the 12 months. Some months it's going to require supplemental. However, it, it really is imperative for HOAs and condos um, to adopt these smart irrigation systems that utilize weather stations. The problem is almost all of our rain sensors that we find on a typical clock work by the, the system of a float. So there's a small little thimble catch basin uh, top of a pole. Um, uh, this one is not that we're looking at. That actually is a true weather station that has Wi-Fi. Um, it's updated every night at 11.59 p.m. of the weather the humidity, the precipitation rate, uh, temperature, everything is calculated in to this site and goes back to a database and basically is uh, uploaded into the clock where it will then start to think on its own in terms of when next should I be watering. So we'll touch on that a little bit more. But most rain sensors, as I said, is a little float, a cork in a little catch basin at the top of a pole. And let's just say it rains at 4 a.m. Um, and your irrigation is not set to go on till 6 a.m. We find that the water that was caught in that little basin and when the float goes to the top, it, it hits a, a sensor and says, OK, you know, it rained, please don't water. Well, that water quickly evaporates over the next hour. The float drops back down and the system says all clear. It's dry out and the irrigation will run again. You know, I'm sure as a manager, you've received many work orders saying my irrigation is running and it's raining outside. Well, that could be rain sensors not functioning, rain sensors in an area where potentially a tree branch is overhanging it and uh, the water isn't going into the catch. So this is a common problem. And, you know, we come out, we inspect, we find out what the issue is. And so they're just not very reliable. Um, so weather stations definitely are the way to go. And they, like, as I mentioned, they monitor humidity, rainfall, temperature, and they will basically model their uh, activity on the soil type as well as the zip code. Um, and that's pretty important um, because based on where exactly you're at in the state will determine your rainfall levels when you get it, temperature changes, et cetera. All right, so we've talked about an irrigation system. Um, and then, you know, we can get into budgeting and how to, you know, put away expenditures for these things. Um, they have definitely come down. Um, these types of systems have advanced significantly over the past 10 years. We find they are a lot more affordable than we, we think, um, especially if you already have the right infrastructure there in place. You know, here we are, we're sitting on one large aquifer here in the, in the state. So we, we've got to be as mindful as we can in regards to efficiently utilizing our water sources. And, and what does it mean? You know, sure, great. We can tell everyone we have a smart irrigation system, but what exactly does that do? Well, so if you're running off of a, a pump system and not pressurized, you're going to elongate uh, the lifespan of your pump system. You are going to put less wear and tear on the heads and the rotors and the moving parts. It's going to be easier to manage the system because most of them are done through a laptop or a, a smart device where you can literally shut them down if there's a mainline break, stop it watering. Um, you know, you don't discover it the next day when there's a four by four foot hole in a section. Um, you know, these systems will alert you to an error and you have the ability to shut it down to a, simply by a text to a phone. So. Um, I've lifted, listed some sites below um, that are very helpful if, uh, if you're looking for more irrigation uh, advice or potential um, systems that are out there. Okay, some things that we battle and uh, uh, especially, you know, as a, as, a, as a board member, as a property manager, 
is complaints regarding potentially the irrigation of why, you know, why is my car, you know, constantly getting hit with the water in my driveway? Um, why is, why are we watering the grass right now at 1 p.m.? Well, a lot of, a lot of the times we find that the division of the irrigation system has not been appropriately set up from the start. Um, there's big push now to try to get architects to better understand the needs of these developers um, in terms of they, you know, most communities love to put flowers at the front entrances, on the bullnose, underneath the sign walls, um, to just bring that kind of luster to the, to the front entrance. Um, but what typically happens is we don't see a division in the irrigation system. So we are what in order for those beds to receive the irrigation, uh, the zone that you turn on that correlates to that spot might be a mist zone for the plants that are on the sides or a rotor zone for the turf that's directly in front of those. So, you know, it definitely makes sense to add a zone or to put a drip line in that will, you know, be able to irrigate these annuals, um, making sure that the, uh, you know, those small finger island part, you know, planting areas in between driveways um, have strip heads on them so that it's just going, you know, uh, one direction and not a, a half head or a full head that's, you know, going to unfortunately spray cars. So it's just a matter of figuring out exactly what the requirements are and making those changes to alleviate potential issues. And, you know, I think if, if any of you manage or live in or belong uh, to a community that has zero lot lines where there's a, a three foot buffer on each side and they both kind of swale down into a middle and that is used to take the runoff and, you know, one house may have a gutter, one may not. The, the gutter collects and, you know, runs out right into this, uh, this slanting three foot slope to the middle and the irrigation is running. This is uh, very difficult to get sun in between these two homes that, that, you know, are back up to each other. And we find this typically becomes a mud pit and, uh, you know, it's a matter of burying the runoff from the gutter um, or uh, simply shutting down the irrigation in that, in that area. Okay. Uh, one of the other, uh, items that, uh, was on the principles was the appropriate fertilization. So we can talk about this for a minute. Um, it's basically fertilizer in terms, uh, from a, uh, a landscape requirement means any substance that will contain one or more recognized plant nutrients and will promote the growth, help control soil acidity or the alkalinity, and will provide soil enrichment or other corrective measures to the soil. And if, uh, if any of you had an opportunity to see a bag of fertilizer or wonder what the label is on the front, this is a very, very important document. And in fact, it's actually uh, a law that each bag of fertilizer has to contain this label and list a number of items on it in order to comply with those standards. And those standards are come through what is known as grade or analysis as the percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the NPK. Um, and they will be guaranteed by the manufacturer to be in that bag of fertilizer. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what is uh, what has to be in that label. So if ever you know your your fertilization uh, vendor is coming out and doing it, you know if you you wanted to just have a peek, um, it's very important uh, what the NPK uh, numbers are in order for you to know what kind of quality fertilizer you're getting. So each label must contain the actual brand brand name as well as the grade which is the three sets of numbers that directly correlate to the NPK, and it's in that order. Nitrogen is the first number, phosphorus the second, potassium the third. They will also have to have the manufacturer's name and their address on the bag to know where it was made, where it came from, the guaranteed analysis, um, and what are the secondary nutrients, um, and, as, and those would be what they call the micros. Um, and then what the actual weight is of that bag. 
they typically only ever come in two weights, either 40 or 50 pounds. Um, and the, the, the NPK numbers is the percentage of the product that is contained within that bag. So the higher number of, of uh, the NPK, the better grade the product is actually going to be. Um, and I'm going to, I see a few questions popping up here. I'm going to take these right after this slide here to see if anything pertains here. Um, but the, you know, what you want to look for is a, you know, a 24010 uh, for turf, for example. That's a higher percentage of active ingredients that are going to be placed down on the turf that you're fertilizing. Whereas something like a 666 is possibly the least expensive fertilizer that you could be, you know, be putting down. And a lot of times this was used on ficus hedges that, you know, used to uh, be everywhere as our hedge material. Now it's clusia, so it's a little different, but so that's what that pertains to. And, you know, depending on where you live and where you're, where you're attending from today, you probably have different requirements or different um, restrictions and maybe a county over from you. I can I can tell you that in St. Lucie County and Martin County, we are not allowed to apply nitrogen in the months from May through September. Um, this is because they, you know, the municipalities understand that we are getting so much rain that there's a good chance that this fertilizer is going to be wasted and immediately flushed down into our into our aquifer. So that's one thing there. But I'm going to take a couple of questions real quick here. Um, Let's see if anything uh, jumps out. Um, all right, I see John here. Messina is asking about single family homes, uh, about Xeroscape. In my opinion, that typically comes down to the docs of the association and whether or not the ARC, uh, your architectural review committee, will allow that type of planting. Some have very strict guidelines that it's got to be what the builder installed and you have to, you know, kind of stick with that. Um, uh, but that that's, you know, kind of varies by each association. Uh, Linda has asked here, can an, uh, a water sensor be added? Yeah, some some older irrigation systems um, definitely can have sensors added. They can be wired in if we're going as far back as say like an intermatic type system, which is which is not digital, that one uh, is different and uh, will, would not apply. Um, let's see here, all right, I think we'll got those just for now and then move on to um, get back to the slide here, let's see. Okay. Um, All right, so why is there such a variation in price on the fertilizers? Well, it really comes down to the, um, the solubility of the material. So, and, and what, is, what exactly does that mean? So the pellets uh, and, and granular typically is the uh, most effective and efficient way to apply the um, minerals into the turf or plants. And the solubility is based on what those um, nutrients are actually covered in. So a sulfur coated or polymer coated material, you're going to find takes a, a much longer time to break down than obviously a product that is used in a spray tank and liquid applied. The liquid typically is very fast moving through the root zone and out. Uh, you'll get very quick effects but they're, they won't be seen for very long. Whereas a granular product with a, uh, and right now, typically every property should be receiving at least because of the advance in the material composition, a 50% or greater um, release. And that means that if the product is a 90 day product, they're guaranteeing that 50, it will break down over the period of a 50% of the time frame it takes for the product to uh, should last. And that's really good. And, and you'll notice that there are so many variations in what a vendor can supply. Um, you could have a, let's just say you could have an 8 to 12 product for, for plants that will be a 50% release. And that bag may cost $24. 
you can have an 8212 with a 100% release with a kearserite or some other uh, agent that will help it break down slower and produce, produce more minerals that will cost 36 to $40 a bag. So there is a real, real big discrepancy between pricing based on the actual blend and how it is formulated and how it's coded. We'll talk about that uh, uh, just, you know, definitely a little bit more here. So, um, you know, the, the, the slower or, you know, the higher the number of solubility, the longer lasting it's, it's going to be. Um, St. Augustine Turf, which is the most popular uh, kind of blend here used in Florida, typically requires about four to six pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. And it may vary slightly depending on your alkalinity, acidity of the soil. And that's easily tested um, with various labs throughout the state. Uh, they're typically anywhere from like six to twenty dollars per sample to have tested. Um, now, this uh, this uh, kind of guaranteed analysis label that went into law uh, right around two thousand and fourteen that you had to have a certification now in order to apply it, which was really, in my opinion, great because people just thought you got a bag of fertilizer, you told you put it into a spreader and off you went. But each of those analysis based on the NPK correlates to a setting on the spreader and to the speed at which you should walk in order to spread it in order to get that correct amount of weight per thousand square foot down. So it's not just that simple. And we found a lot of people were incorrectly applying fertilizer was being wasted communities weren't receiving what they should and and i say we because i i sit on the certification committee um through the florida nursery growers and landscape association so these are certain things that i've lobbied for to you know kind of help create industry standards um we also have many certifications through the fngla um in order to help landscapers become more knowledgeable um and uh, you know they're very very important in my in my opinion. Um, okay, let's see. Let's move on to the next one. Let me get too detailed into this. Um, okay, let's see here. So let me just make sure I do not go back. Okay. Um, so uh, ring of responsibility, a another one of the six principles. What exactly does that mean? So uh, a lot of communities are have runoff areas, retention areas, or simply ponds or lakes uh, in order to, one, uh, take excessive runoff, um, use for irrigation purposes, uh, aesthetically just beautify the, the site. There are requirements in terms of applying fertilizer, and this goes down to what is known as the ring of responsibility. So within 10 feet of any water body, you are not permitted to use a rotary spreader um, to apply fertilizer. You could use a drop spreader within that distance where it is literally just falling directly under the machine. Um, however, if you are using a rotary spreader, you have to be a minimum of 10 feet up. And if your rotary spreader throws 10 feet, you then go up a further five feet to ensure you don't get those pellets any closer than the 10 feet area around the water body. Here's some things that we don't normally talk about. So when new grass goes down, definitely do not need to apply fertilizer for at least the first uh, say 30, 45 days. Um, uh, there's also something called fertigation. It's rarely used anymore, but we should just mention it. That was the idea to inject uh, liquid fertilizer into the irrigation system. Um, it was uh, effective for um, certain properties, uh, obviously not ones that potentially could have missed uh, the irrigation heads onto cars because that uh, the iron uh, certainly did not leave uh, pleasant stains for those that were uh, parked beside them. Uh, so that's kind of gone away a little bit. Um, and then also, you know, just understanding how to treat um, the uh, plant material um, that are in these areas, palms, trees, and shrubs, for example. Okay, another idea um, in terms of the uh, best management practices. 
and this is a, one of those topics that really gets discussed in uh, in great detail, I think, at communities, and that is mulching, whether or not we should, whether we shouldn't mulch. And here's, here's some kind of uh, factual evidence to either support or not support your argument for mulching. And what is it? So it basically refers to the recycling of materials. It could be uh, and some is, you know, literally pallets um, on a cheaper bag of mulch and others use nothing but hardwoods um, that air uh, landscape debris brought into a site that collects it and they will then further uh, break it down and will dye it or leave it natural. And uh, here's some of the benefits that we are aware of for mulching of beds. So uh, at a and all of this is based on a two to three inch layer. Anything less we find does not necessarily achieve these results that are listed here. So at a two to three inch layer of mulch, we notice that there is definitely a prevention of loss of water um, through evapo evaporation, uh, evapotranspiration. The mulch will suppress weeds uh, much better at a two to three inch depth. It will create a more uniform soil temperature. It will stop the soil from crusting, um, which will allow a improved absorption and percolation rates through those beds. The mulch actually will break down probably over a, uh, usually a three to five month period that will help create more organic material and adding nutrient content to the soil. Um, it can provide um, some area for the uh, the roots to grow in um, than, than an area that is unmulched. And, you know, to some, uh, definitely will say aesthetically, it adds beauty, not to, you know, not to everybody. Some people love red mulch, some hate it, some love, you know, the pine bark brown, others think it's purple. So it's all an opinion. And, but in for a uh, as a landscaper, I can tell you, I advocate for mulch simply for the beneficial factors that it does for the plants in the area of the beds you would be mulching. And that does not apply to rock. Rock uh, is something that I agree people love. Aesthetically, it lasts. It is uh, economical in the long run. However, the uh, rocks in terms of a, um, a mulch bed make the soil hotter, dries out the roots quicker. Um, it is uh, less easy to uh, you know, change a plant in and out. As the plant grows and widens, the rocks can you know, scratch it and scar it or create an opening for pests to get in. So that's just a personal opinion. Um, and uh, I, uh, I always like to throw this slide in here because that's, uh, you know, we see a lot out there in the landscape and landscapers do get blamed for a lot of things. And uh, most of the time, it I will say it, it is us. We're operating heavy equipment uh, in extreme heats and uh, fatigue definitely does take place. But, you know, these uh, these gnomes and, and, you know, ceramic cats placed out in the, uh, are just a nightmare for us to deal with because, you know, things will shoot out of the deck and hit them and break them. And next thing you know, we're, we're replacing uh, garden gnomes uh, all over the you know the southeast but also this this one also is just to illustrate kind of that transition um you know whether you're a fan of this uh cypress mulch or not it's a nice variation from color anyway so um all right so uh you know what let me see here i'm going to take just a quick minute here uh we're good on time and just see if any new questions have come in here um Okay, somebody's asking about whitefly. We are going to touch on IPM shortly, so I'll, I will remember. I'll write that down, and, uh, and I'll come back to that one on the ficus. Um, uh, fertilizer for zoysia. Yes, there are certain types of fertilizer very specific for zoysia. There's a product called Turf Royale, um, and uh, there are blends now that contain carbon um, that will help elongate the, uh, the feeding of the zoysia. It's very hungry turf, typically should be fed every sort of 45 to 60 days. Um, and whether it be cashmere, 
Um, we also need to make sure that you, for the real true care, uh, and this is this is to answer George here, um, zoysia bermudas, they do need to be aerated, verticut and top dressed once a year uh, in order for them to be healthy. Um, so that would definitely help um, if you've got areas of zoysia. Um, little open-ended question there regarding uh, what can I do in terms of... Um, Okay, here's a good one, since we're talking about fertilizer. Weed and feed. Um, so weed and feed was a very effective means of uh, a way to kind of uh, reduce weed population. Um, however, over the past years, the allowable amount of atrazine has been dropped to 1% in your bag of weed and feed. So I, I, I you know, if it's in your contract, you might want to discuss with your landscaper um, about adjusting that to go away from a weed and feed granular to potentially a spray program. Um, and you're right, master gardener class now say that it's, it's just, it's ineffective. Um, so that's a, a great question there. Um, uh, colored mulch, not a problem. Um, it's really preference. Uh, I say to stay away from the red. Sometimes they, there's a link more to like carcinogenic properties than the dyes that are used in the red not so much in the black or the pine bark brown. Um, uh, rubber mulch, definitely, this is Dominic. Um, rubber mulch is one of those products that uh, it does get warmer. Um, it is a permanent. Um, so for a long-term project, playgrounds, rubber mulch is great as long as it's the recycled with, uh, you know, the metal removed if it came from car tires. Um, definitely want to look for those playground approved rubber mulches. Um, uh, and we're here, uh, Garth's got a question here in regards to mulching the clippings. So in the state of Florida with St. Augustine grass, University of Florida does not recommend to bag the clippings. Um, they want to see those uh, grass clippings go back into the turf where it'll break down and create organic matter for the soil. Yes, I would definitely spray the weeds before mulching the areas. Um, they could still grow right up through that mulch if they are thriving. Um, and then, uh, okay, let me just get out of this one now and then we'll get back to the, okay. So mulch, plant, or turf. A lot of commercial sites have bed areas that tend to be narrow in nature. Um, it cre you know, basically creates a scenario where a choice needs to be made as what am I going to use? Am I gonna use turf? Am I gonna mulch it? Um, I can tell you that I, in, in, in my experience, a 18 inch, most sod pieces, most St. Augustine turf is two foot long by 18 inch wide. This, anything less than 18 inches is going to struggle next to a concrete area uh, due to it not being able to dissipate the heat effectively. Um, the actual practices that will be used to cut it, you probably can only weed eat it um, based on what's on both sides. Um, you know, the ability to get irrigation to it effectively and the right amount. Um, and then, so a lot of times mulch truly is the best option for an area like this. However, it's not the most cost effective. So typically it won't be utilized. Um, but in my opinion, another great kind of replacement would be an ornamental grass, but every site's going to dictate differently. And here's, it brings right into this topic of, you know, what, what do we do? Do we use a ground cover? Do we use mulch? Do we use um, turf? This is, I think this was a, a Publix parking lot um, that was that was built. And you can see by the curbs, brand new parking. It's a brand new facility. Um, that grass has not survived. It's struggling because it's on a steep slope. The mower, when it was going along it, um, was pulling the grass down, tearing it. The runoff was extensive. The grass wasn't able to maintain the water in the root system because it was so steep. Um, so that becomes just very difficult to maintain. This is in that same plaza. Um, this was further down. There was an existing Home Depot. Um, they added the Publix. And uh, so here was an area that they had a very string, uh, thin strip. And you can see the grass has struggled. One of two things, it's, it's abutted by concrete on both sides, making it probably 15 to 20 degrees warmer, um, drying out the root system, very compact area uh, due to being able to install those, those 
you know, the concrete and, and asphalt. And then we have a completely different scenario where these oak trees are to give shade, um, probably for the pedestrians to get to the, uh, the businesses. And as you can see, the sidewalk is, you know, a light gray or black area. And that's because that shade has held the water in those areas after the irrigation or rain, making it slippery. And so it's just a, just a, a bad design, in, in my opinion. Okay, mowing. And we're going to get through here. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, most uh, turf varieties in Florida are St. Augustine or Floritam, as mentioned. The correct height really should be uh, based on UF guidelines is three to four inches in height. And if it's maintained shorter, it's going to struggle to create density and root health, or, you know, it's, it's not going to be able to suppress the weeds, which just, there are thousands of weed seeds in every square inch of soil. And all they need is a little bit of sunlight to germinate. So we want to keep that root health and density of the turf really thick and thriving in order to not allow weed seeds to germinate. Um, that grass is going to help runoff. Um, it's going to ensure that the nutrients are absorbed and not wasted. Um, if there are less weeds, it means we need less herbicide. And as I said before, um, you know, three to four inches, and but you should never remove more than a third of the grass blade. And we have found in our zone, 36 times per year is a kind of the minimum that you should be mowing. Uh, most of our contracts are 34 to 42, um, but budget dictates that as well. So, um, but that is the recommended. Pruning, wouldn't we love to all see this and not hear your hedge trimmers going through the neighborhood or have the ability to prune by hand? Um, typically we don't, we don't have that ability. Um, we are left to use hedge trimmers um, that, uh, you know, will we'll cut everything in a line or, you know, we can maybe leave it a little fluffy, but um, in order to get through the amount of material at each, home, at each home based on a budget, typically requires us to use a hedge, uh, you know, a mechanical hedge trimmer of some sort. But the actual practice of pruning is to improve the health, remove out the dead weed, uh, reduce risk of failure, help control the growth. Uh, so it's not either, you know, growing against the wall, growing into an AC unit, et cetera. Um, the fruiting or flowering doesn't necessarily pertain to a lot of uh, our communities um, in terms of they want a uniform look and everything to be trimmed and boxed or, or tight at each, you know, service. So, um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of communities such as like Evergreen and Palm Beach Garden, which is an Audubon community where everything is left to be just a little bit fluffy, but takes a, you know, takes a certain tolerance to be able to do that. All right, we'll talk about a couple of, uh, of myths. Um, and these are always fun. Um, you know, you hear, oh, the hedge has gotten so thin at the bottom and, you know, landscaper tells you, or, or you hear, or somebody on the board, somebody in the community says, oh no, you have to cut it down from the top in order to make it fill in at the bottom. Well, I don't know if you remembered seeing me at the beginning of this, uh, but I am, I am lacking a lot of hair. So trust me, if I, I know for sure that, uh, you know, cutting the hair on my head does not make the hair on my legs grow any thicker. So I can tell you that is purely a myth. Otherwise I'd start shaving the hair on my legs, hoping it would fill in on the top. Doesn't work. So just trust me, cutting the top does not make the bottom thicken up. If you want the bottom of your hedge to thicken up, you have to go in and make cuts that, and on, any, on as many branches as possible, and everywhere you make a cut, you will get two branches come off. That is how you thicken up a hedge at the base. Um, rocks are not like mulch. Um, they, they do not provide the same level of organic material. They, like I mentioned, you know, I won't get into it again. They're hotter, et cetera. Um, fertilizing at the base of palms. No, that is a myth. You do not do that. The root system is not there. There is what's known as a root shoot ratio that pertains to the fronds or branches on the tree. So the roots are typically at the drip line of your palm trees fronds or your trees branches. You wanna fertilize at the drip zone of your trees or palms. That is where the root systems are actively feeding, not at the base of the palm. So that is a myth. Um, Roundup um, kills everything. Yes, that is true if it is actually sprayed on the plant. Roundup is completely inert 
when it is touching the soil, if there's no plant there, it will not be absorbed through the soil down into the root system of a plant and kill it. That is a myth. Um, you cannot hurt plants or the turf with too much water. That is also a myth. You absolutely can. Um, you can create a weak root system. You can make them become anaerobic, which means they're constantly flooded and not having the ability to absorb oxygen from the soil. So yes, overwatering can definitely hurt that. Um, okay, let's see here. Okay, we uh, there was a question about the pesticide for the ficus uh, earlier on um, that I touched on, and we're gonna we'll get to that here in the responsible management of pesticides. So. If all of the components that we talked about earlier are all managed correctly, it'll hopefully alleviate any needs for pesticides. The concept of integrated pest management is just that. It's the emphasis, the emphasis, of, I apologize, emphasis on these components, how you mow, the sharpness of your blades, the height that you're mowing at, the, uh, the trimming when you're doing it, seasonally, uh, monthly, quarterly, um, the application of fertilizer at the right time um, of the year, you know, not applying all the fertilizer when things are just about, you know, if you're in North Florida and you, you can potentially get frost, you're not going to apply the fertilizer in January where it'll just sit and never be used because the, the, the plants have shut down um, during the cold snap. And then irrigation. Irrigation to me is the most important component because it regulates everything within the landscape. So you apply a bag of fertilizer, typically that fertilizer needs to be watered in a quarter inch or half inch based on the product. So the last thing you wanna do is run your irrigation system for two hours on an area you just played, place fertilizer and then have it all washed out or start breaking down quicker. Um, when you apply pesticides, you wanna make sure you're not immediately you know, rinsing it off before it's gotten into the root system or absorbed into the leaves. Um, you, some products are need to be watered in. So all of these factors roll around irrigation. So it's very important to make sure that's managed correctly. And if you're using the right plant, right place principle, you will definitely find that pesticides become a thing of the past. I'm gonna leave this one up here. Um, I could read right through it. It is the actual definition of the law um, that pertains to pest control. It is, uh, I'll read it, your head will hurt afterwards. It uh, probably contains uh, the most long words in any paragraph uh, you'll read. Um, and it's basically saying that the application of any of the products that have been deemed safe by the EPA, DEP, um, are only safe if utilized by the label and you are mixing and applying per that label. So that is um, why there is a law, that is why pest control is so regulated and why we like to go to IPMs is because we are not blanket applicating products for potential areas that are only affected for a hundred square foot of chinch or grub in a small area. Um, we want to allow the beneficials to be able to do their job as effectively as possible within a site versus blanketing chemicals that are going to be harmful to more than just what they're treating. Um, you know, so here's some of the requirements. Um, need to have an occupational license. You need to be able to carry your limited certificate of commercial landscape maintenance. You have to have your business license and be a certified operator. Um, arborists also require a license. Uh, recently, um, there has been a big push on the BMP certificate in order to apply herbicides. Um, and there are big fines now if you are not carrying that license and are not certified. In fact, I, I believe uh, Palm Beach County recently added like 13 um, new uh, inspectors to make sure that's being done. We talked about IPM. So we don't want to use chemicals. We want to get away from them as, as much as possible. And in order to do that, we have to identify the key pests that are there, which plants they're affecting. And then we've got to determine which life cycle are they in because different products or different methods are used to, you know, to attack it, whether it be at the egg stage, 
the nymph, the pupa, and then how are we going to do it? Are we going to physically remove, pick off and throw to the ground, hose off? Are we going to apply, uh, if a hibiscus has aphids, are we gonna put ladybugs on there because that's their favorite food is an aphid? Um, or culturally, are we going to make sure that the program we have in place is correct? Like irrigating the right amount every day, um, you know, applying the right nutrients, et cetera. So you just have to figure out which uh, method is the most appropriate at the time. Okay, real quick couple of fun slides here. Um, here we have a, you know, a, a decent lance. It's kind of a very typical builder's package. Um, you know, you've got podocarpus lining the driveway, nice area of turf grass. You've got some crotons to provide color, some tie plants to give a little bit of height and different texture. Um, spacing is pretty decent. So, and please uh, disregard the spelling errors on here. Uh, I'm not sure what happened on this slide. Um, autocorrect, I'm thinking, but I want to, I want you to envision an area. And in this area, there are five DD Blanchards, uh, Magnolias, um, that will get, you know, 20 foot wide by potentially 40 feet tall, four Montgomery Palms, I believe they're doubles, two Silver Bismarcks, which will grow 20 feet wide by 50 feet tall, uh, two Oak Trees, you know how large they get, uh, Fishtail Clusters, if you're not familiar with those, they're like a uh, uh, an areca palm on steroids, but all green. Um, they get huge, 30 feet tall, 20 feet wide. Two traveler palms, you know, like a bird of paradise, but much larger. Ligustrum, uh, kind of a, you know, an evergreen type, uh, you know, rounded, uh, small tree, ornamental tree. Some lady palm clusters. Envision all of this plant material in a, in a very small space. And this is what you get. So this is a uh, side of a house in between two homes. Uh, there was about, I think it was somewhere around 15 foot of spacing, 20 foot maybe between the two homes. This was their side yard to access their, their pool area in the back. So all of that material I just read off, not even encountering counting some of the, the ground materials like the variegated ginger, some ilex shilling there. All of this was from the space of the backyard to the front of the house. It gets no sun. The turf can't survive. The mulch that's there gets run off quickly because the water shoots across the top of the turf or the, the sand, I should say, because there is no turf. Um, it's just a mess and we can't do anything with it. Plants die because they get no sun. Those that, uh, you know, grow the quickest are getting the sun. They'll stay green. So we see this a lot and people go, why does my side yard look like this? Well, this is why. Um, builders will tend to overplant. People may overplant hoping to get privacy from their neighbor. But none of you have this on your properties, I'm sure. So everybody is used to it looking like, like this, right? This is how we like to see it. Um, this is also a zero lot line side. You can see the, the house on the other side. I would say it's 12 feet away. Um, there's no real tall overhanging coming across both properties. Uh, trees or palms, they're they're thinned out, um, they're appropriate, um, and you can now see this turf grass. And these homes, these examples, are facing the same way. Um, they've got the exact same exposure, just the difference in the planting. So, all right, I'm going to fly through here. Um, same community, uh, you know, would any of you want to park your car underneath this 50-foot tall royal? Um, those seed pods weigh about 40 to 60 pounds, so um, good luck on... Uh, on that scenario when they fall off. Um, I mean, it just makes no sense, but we see it, we deal with it. Kind of parking lot area here, uh, lack of mulch, turf grass struggling, oak trees not planted correctly. Um, and so this slide, this is what I wanna show you real quick. This is what we saw prior to the towns, cities, municipalities creating a ordinance of how you should streetscape. So here in West Palm, this is on Okeechobee Boulevard. You cannot see turf, palms, trees anywhere along this strip. If you've ever had to walk or be on the, it is so hot there. It's just not regulated. And this is what it looked like prior to 04 and 06 when all those ordinances came into place. Here we go. This is after the, that time frame. Great transition, great use of plants, great shading, um, just, you know, really well done. This is that parking lot, the great utilization of the tree so that it creates shade into the parking areas. Um, just really did a great job on this one particular 
behind here is a humongous uh, shopping plaza. There's a Publix in here. There's, you know, uh, gas stations, McDonald's, et cetera. Can't see it. Another great job. This is Donald Ross, just an example of, you know, good planting. And I'll leave this one up for you. There are, there are two slides here. This is just to show you, this was from 2010. They have not done a 2020, but I've, I've had a peek into some of the numbers. The landscape industry as a whole uh, creates somewhere about, uh, about a $20 billion influx of uh, kind of revenue being generated either through the sale of plant material, um, the development of um, uh, nursery centers and you know garden centers, et cetera, uh, as well as the growers that are local or mom and pops besides you know a cost at a Home Depot. But uh, you know that, that there might be one of these counties represented by where you live. And uh, this is the number of jobs that are provided in this industry. And this was 2010. Again, this has uh, this has gone up about, I think, like 35, 40 percent uh, since this was done. And again, you can see here, um, you know, uh, just the massive revenue that's created from this industry. So I'm going to quickly look up, see if there's any more additional questions and we will Take it, uh, mulch, you should, uh, Sharon Smith asked, how often should you mulch? Uh, twice a year is usually ample. Um, let's see. Um, okay, yep, somebody had mentioned about uh, reclaimed water, reused water from the city tends to be higher nitrogen. That is true. Um, what we found is if you have reclaimed water, which is the purple pipe that's been uh, being utilized, um, we find that you can get away with two to three fertilizations a year, some properties even one. Um, so it's a great question there for, from Stephen uh, Parampas. Um, uh, I always think here in South Florida, our zone, Best time to cut back hedges and plants is usually around March or April, right before the growing season. Um, yes, uh, landscape cloth is great. Um, in smaller beds, not probably very effective if you're doing it on a large commercial site. Um, let's see. Shady areas uh, for turf in Palm Beach County, Myra asked. Typically a palmetto is uh, one of the best varieties for that, but still not a cure-all. Yes, melorganite, Annette Gadus asked about, can melorganite be used? Um, yes, that can after it, it is, uh, it's not containing any of the, um, it's a more natural product. So yes, it's, uh, it's okay to add that a week or two after. Um, chinch bugs, um, that is something within the soil. Um, it's nothing that typically causes infestation. It just exists in your soil. Some communities have it, some don't. Um, just, it just depends on the site. Yes, longer watering cycles are more effective than shorter ones. Um, so yes, I would suggest going to a, uh, you know, kind of a 50% increase there uh, for a certain amount of time to get those root systems deeper or a cycle soak where you would do four minutes on wait, wait 10 minutes for that water to get in then four minutes again, if you need to preserve or you know, conserve your water if you're on a certain water permit uh, usage. Bahia grass is used typically along roadways, open areas where you would not fertilize um, and the maintenance practices are a little less, more, more natural. Uh, you also cannot apply pesticides or fertilizer to Bahia. So that's gotta be in areas that are unseen because it grows much quicker too, but then also goes dormant in the winter. Um, uh, Gary asked, does weed killer at a base of a palm damage the palm? Only if it's feeder roots, uh, this is a newly installed palm and the feeder roots are at the top. If it just came out of a pot into the ground, I would suggest not spraying herbicide there. Uh, for quite some time until its root systems are well away from uh, the uh, the base of the tree, I would suggest putting a bag of mulch on there uh, in order to prevent the weeds germinating for that particular. Um, uh, whitefly, whitefly is still around. Uh, it's definitely dissipating. The products being used have gotten stronger and uh, definitely working better. So um, there are products out there for whitefly. 
Chinch bags, best time to treat them pre-treat is typically around March, but they can uh, kind of pop up anytime. So uh, hopefully here I have uh, gotten through and got to answer a lot of the questions. Um, oh, uh, Myra asked about Ganoderma. Last one, and then we'll we'll turn it back over to Ashley. Um, asking about Ganoderma. Yes, anytime you identify a palm with Ganoderma, the correct move is to have it removed uh, as soon as you can. You should take the conch um, and wear gloves, break it off, put it inside of a Ziploc bag so that during the removal period, it does not happen to get hit and allow the, the, uh, the actual spores to be spread. Um, and then uh, my suggestion usually is to have the entire stump removed. It can be ground, but again, if there was a conch that was growing and had not fully uh, emerged, so you didn't know it was there, you could spread the spores. Um, and, you know, we're finding that uh, there, the, the soil was told if it's treated, you could go back with a tree. We're finding that that's not true. Uh, putting hardwoods back in the place of a palm that had Ganoderma, we are seeing declines in those oaks now. Um, I would say to leave those beds free for a while uh, until we have more research. So I, uh, I would like to say thank you to everyone for joining. I appreciate your time. And uh, again, good luck to all those in the storm's path. And uh, thanks again and uh, look forward to the next one. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.